Well, finally, finally, Apple has gotten into the 2020s along with the rest of us by announcing a product called Personal Intelligence that's deeply integrated into all of their products. And while it's taken them about forever to get here, and it's going to be a slow rollout to get all of this stuff up to speed, as in it could take up to a year for all of the things that they talk about today to actually come into existence, what I saw today was actually really, really cool, assuming that they can pull it off. But the one announcement that garnered a lot of furor, in particular from Elon Musk, is that OpenAI's ChatGPT is going to be integrated into the iPhone, the Mac, etc. Is this a reason for Elon to go and make the much anticipated X phone? Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know It All, and I guess Dr. Knows AI. I am not going to say Dr. Knows AI all the time. I'll say Dr. Know It All for either channel. Anyway, if you don't know, I've started a new AI and robotics centric channel, Dr. Knows AI, that is related, of course, to Dr. Know It All. The original Dr. Know It All channel will maintain a focus on Tesla and SpaceX. Today is actually a perfect crossover video vehicle, so the timing is great to do one video for both platforms. However, they will be slightly different. In the version that goes to Dr. No's AI, I'm going to focus on what Apple talks about and my thoughts about that, including the ChatGPT integration at the end. And then at the end of that, I will put my thoughts on Elon Musk and the broader X community's response to what Apple talked about today. So if you want to catch the longer version, watch it on Dr. Know It All. If you want to catch just the version that's about the Apple announcements and everything in its own right, look at the Dr. No's AI. And if you want to be nice, watch it on both platforms. And don't forget to subscribe over on Dr. Knows AI and also on Dr. Know It All if you happen to have not subscribed there as well. Thank you. All right, so one thing that's super, super annoying with these new kind of slick keynotes is that they have tons and tons of music integrated into them. So I'm not going to be able to play a ton of the actual original keynote. I will, of course, leave a link to that in the description, but I'm working off of a transcript of this from YouTube. So you can see here, I've bold faced important points and everything like that. But anyway, I will start off with a couple of moments that I can actually replay because they don't have music in them. Thank you, Apple, for doing that. I really wish everybody would just turn off the music on their keynotes. It would make clipping their stuff to discuss it much, much easier. Anyway, I'm going to start about the one hour and seven minute mark. There is a lot of stuff before that. Like I said, if you're interested in all the other stuff that they announced today, definitely watch the earlier parts of the keynote, but I'm going to start with this part. At Apple, it's always been our goal to design powerful personal products that enrich people's lives by enabling them to do the things that matter most as simply and easily as possible. We've been using artificial intelligence and machine learning for years to help us further that goal. Recent developments in generative intelligence and large language models offer powerful capabilities that provide the opportunity to take the experience of using Apple products to new heights. So as we look to build in these incredible new capabilities, we want to ensure that the outcome reflects the principles at the core of our products. It has to be powerful enough to help with the things that matter most to you. It has to be intuitive and easy to use. It has to be deeply integrated into your product experiences. Most importantly, it has to understand you and be grounded in your personal context, like your routine, your relationships, your communications and more. And of course, it has to be built with privacy from the ground up. Together, all of this goes beyond artificial intelligence. It's personal intelligence, and it's the next big step for Apple. And of course, there you have it. Tim gives us the big picture. It's gotta be powerful, intuitive, integrated. It's gotta be able to understand your personality and everything, and it's got to be secure and private. Y'all know I'm a tech fan, but I'm also a huge watch nerd. I love high-end luxury watches, but they're priced like high-end luxury items. That's why I was incredibly excited when Aura Watches contacted me to sponsor today's video. Aura produces beautiful high-end watches at an amazing price. Just look at these gorgeous designs. I have a 70s-inspired Tiffany Blue date model with integrated bracelet and a mesmerizing black skeletonized watch that I can't stop staring at. And these aren't some cheap quartz watches either. They're fully mechanical watches with a high quality beating heart and an open case back so you can see how all the complex mechanics work together to tell the time. And better yet, they're automatic winding so you can just wear them and they're always fully wound, accurately telling the time every day. With dead flat sapphire crystal fronts and 50 meters water resistance, they're tough as well as beautiful. This AP Royal Oak inspired beauty with date and gorgeous Tiffany blue tapisserie dial is a stunner. I can't wear it out of the house without getting compliments and questions about where to get the 
watch. It's got an industry standard Seiko NH35A movement and is an extremely wearable 40 millimeters and only 11.75 millimeters thick, so it fits right under any cuff. And check out Aura's skeletonized watch in black and gold. You can look right through the high quality Hangzhou 7500A movement and see all the inner workings from both sides. I love the way the gold pops from the black, the way you can see the escapement beating from the front, the gorgeous finishing, and the super wearable size at 40 millimeters width and 11.75 millimeters thick. It's perfect for just about any wrist. Be sure to click the link below and use my code Dr. 30 at checkout to get an additional 30% off anything on the site. That makes Aura's incredible values even better. And be sure to check out Aura.watch for their huge selection of amazing watches, as well as different strap options so you can mix up the look easily. They even include a simple tool to adjust bracelet links so you can have the perfect fit in no time. Remember to click my link and use Dr. 30 to save 30% off your new favorite watch. And now let's get back to it. And as you heard at the end, Tim Cook refers to it as personal intelligence. They don't use AI or artificial intelligence all that much in the keynote. They either say personal intelligence or machine learning. They seem to be very averse to using the term artificial intelligence, which, which is perfectly fine by me, by the way. I think that that term is way overused and overhyped. So I think it's actually good they're taking a different tack with this. Introducing Apple intelligence the new personal intelligence system that makes your most personal products even more useful and delightful. To tell you all about it, here's Craig. This is a moment we've been working towards for a long time. We're tremendously excited about the power of generative models. And there are already some really impressive chat tools out there that perform a vast array of tasks using world knowledge. But these tools know very little about you or your needs. With iOS 18, iPadOS 18, and macOS Sequoia, we are embarking on a new journey to bring you intelligence that understands you. Apple Intelligence is the personal intelligence system that puts powerful generative models right at the core of your iPhone, iPad, and Mac. It draws on your personal context to give you intelligence that's most helpful and relevant for you. It protects your privacy at every step, and it is deeply integrated into our platforms and throughout the apps you rely on to communicate, work, and express yourself. Let's take a closer look at Apple intelligence, starting with its incredible capabilities. Then we'll tell you about its unique architecture. And after that, will show you how it elevates so many of your everyday experiences. Let's begin with capabilities. Apple Intelligence will enable your iPhone, iPad, and Mac to understand and create language as well as images and take action for you to simplify interactions across your apps. And what's truly unique is its understanding of your personal context. Language and text are fundamental to how we communicate and work. And the large language models built into Apple Intelligence deliver deep, natural language understanding, making so many of your day-to-day -day tasks faster and easier. For example, your iPhone can prioritize your notifications to minimize unnecessary distractions while ensuring you don't miss something important. All right, so pretty much after that, the rest of the keynote has music underneath it, which is super, super annoying. So I'll revert to the transcript with my bold face, the notes and everything in there. So first of all, powerful generative models right in the core of your iPhone, iPad, and Mac. That's one of the things that Craig said. And then the really big thing is it has personalized context. It actually understands who you are. Now, one of the things that people <clears throat> out there are freaking out about is privacy concerns, but we're going to get to the architecture in just a minute. And I think that Apple has actually done a pretty good job of mitigating the privacy concerns. So starting with something near and dear to my heart, and there's actually two really, really big things that I'm very, very happy are going to exist in the new version of the iPhone and the Mac OS. The first one is prioritizing your notifications. And that means that it will understand, hopefully well, it'll understand which notifications you actually care about and which ones you need to be served and which ones can be backgrounded that you don't care about so much. So that's a nice way of using personalized context with artificial intelligence or Apple intelligence to be able to make your life better. And it's something that a traditional LLM that is just an application and not integrated into your operating system could never do. 
Also, the new AI will have image generation capabilities. I mean, it kind of better have that. It also has the ability to read in images. Not sure about video so much, but definitely has the ability to read in images. And it can output images, but unfortunately only in sketch, illustration, and animation format. In other words, nothing photorealistic. I have a feeling that they're doing that because they don't want to be accused of creating deep fakes. Sketch, illustration, and animation are all clearly not real, so they don't have to worry about deep fake issues. So that would be my guess as to why they don't have photo real. Maybe they will eventually introduce that, but I have a feeling that they probably won't due to those exact kind of concerns. Another huge thing, and this actually has implications for other companies, is that Apple is integrating this stuff all very, very deeply and is going to, and it doesn't do this yet, but over the next year, this is why I said it's kind of a slow rollout, the AI will be able to act on your behalf inside of the operating system and inside of apps to be able to do things. So you could have it go through your emails to remember like when your mom said she was flying in. You could then have it go and look on an app that was like an airplane tracking app to see where the flight might be. And then you could have it integrate with a text message that you could send your mom. All of that stuff could be done automatically. If that sounds like stuff that the Humane Pin and the Rabbit R1 have claimed that they're going to do, yes, that actually is. And a big advantage that Apple actually has, and we're gonna to get to Siri in just a minute, is that you won't actually have to talk to it. There's a new type to Siri way of using Siri, which is gonna be really, really fantastic. So if it's in kind of a quiet area, like an elevator or a meeting or something like that, you can, there's some sort of keyboard press or something like that. It brings up an interface so that you can actually type your question in and get your answer typed out rather than having to speak to it and listen to it. So between the app integration and the ability for this to act on your behalf within the phone or Mac or whatever it is, and the fact that you can type instead of having to talk all the time, that gives these that gives Apple a huge leg up over the Rabbit R1, over the Humane Pin, etc. So some of the examples they have are things like pull up the files that Jaws shared with me last week, or show me all the photos of mom, Olivia, and me, or play the podcast that my wife sent the other day. So the whole idea is that Apple intelligence will orchestrate things across apps for you and use fuzzy commands rather than very specific commands to take action on your behalf. And of course, a ton of this depends on your personal context. And that's why it's really interesting. If you don't know, like your phone is probably, it probably knows you better than you know yourself at this point. That data is just not being exploited in a good way to really, really help you out. It's just sort of stored there. So the idea of this AI, Apple intelligence, is going to be able to bring out that information that the phone already kind of knows and utilize it in a way that's helpful to you while retaining the privacy, at least according to Apple. So it will be able to look at your screen just like Microsoft's new version of of their OS that will look at screen grabs of your computer all the time and be able to then respond to questions about that. So it's in that same category of slightly creepy, like following along with all everything that you're doing. Is that too much invasion of privacy? I don't know. We'll just have to see how it's handled. And in just a minute, I'll talk about the architecture and how Apple is actually protecting your privacy again, supposedly. So as Craig says in the keynote, understanding this kind of personal context is essential for delivering truly helpful intelligence, but it has to be done right. You should not have to hand over all the details details of your life to be warehoused and analyzed in someone's AI cloud. So this, of course, is where Apple starts to talk about how they're going to operate differently. And one of the things they're going to do is utilize the native compute that's on phones, on laptops, on computers, etc., to be able to do a lot of this AI work on device. So in other words, it won't have to go to the cloud. It can stay on your device, and that allows a great deal of privacy, which I think is a really, really laudable that Apple is doing this. Yes, it's taken them forever to catch up with everybody else, but I actually like this way of doing that a lot better than having everything go to the cloud. Number one, of course, it will protect your privacy because things will stay on your device a lot and it's not all the time. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. But number two, it's going to make a lot of this stuff happen way, way faster than any other solution right now. You're not going to have that gigantic lag of uploading to the cloud, getting a response back, downloading it back down again to your phone or to your laptop. It's going to happen relatively instantaneously. So as Craig says, we have integrated it deep into your iPhone, iPad, and Mac. And through out your apps so it's aware of your personal data without collecting your personal data. So that's a really big caveat there. This is only possible through our unique integration of hardware and software and our years-long investment in building advanced silicon for on-device intelligence. And with our most advanced Apple Silicon, the A17 Pro, which is on the new iPhones, and the M family of chips, we have the computational foundation to power Apple intelligence. And by the way, if you want to use this stuff, you're going to have to have an iPhone 15 Pro or an M-series laptop, desktop, or iPhone 
iPad. So just make note of that. If you have an iPhone 14 or if you have an older iPad or something like that, it necessitates having the A17 and the M series of chips. So Apple specifically calls out that they're using large language models and diffusion models. Diffusion models are what traditionally does generative artwork, things like that, visual images. Large language models, of course, do language. So it's a combination of those two things, but a lot of this, again, is going to be done on device as opposed to in the cloud. They also have what's called an on-device semantic index that can organize and surface information from across your apps. What that means is in the background with spare compute cycles, it's actually going through all of your stuff and it's indexing. It's looking, is that a person? What person is it? Is that a dog? Is that a screen capture, etc.? It's semantically segmenting out the information on your phone, on your laptop, etc. And that means when you ask questions of it, it already kind of knows things. It's already figured out this is your mom or something along those lines and this is your dog or these are screen grabs that you're probably not particularly interested in. You know, you just use them for a period of time unless you specifically ask for a screen grab that had a certain thing in it. One of the examples they talk about is if you've ever taken a picture of your driver's license, it can go back and, and semantically figure out this is a picture of a driver's license. Here is the number on it. I can then give you that number so you don't have to go searching for it yourself. And then you can put it into a web form or something like that if you're required to add your driver's license number. So that semantic understanding of everything that is you is going to be very, very crucial to be able to, as they call it, surface, bring to the top the information that you really want to know at that particular moment. But then there are some things you can't do on device. They're just too complicated. And this is really interesting. What they say is, we want to extend the privacy and security of your iPhone, and I assume other Mac OS devices, into the cloud to unlock even more intelligence for you. So we have created private cloud compute. Private cloud compute allows Apple intelligence to flex and scale its computational capacity and draw on even larger server-based models for more complex requests while protecting your privacy. These models run on servers we have especially created using Apple Silicon. These Apple Silicon servers offer the privacy and security of your iPhone from the Silicon on up. So when you make a request on your phone or on your laptop or something, the device figures out whether it can handle it on device. If it can't, it creates an end-to-end -end secure communication link to specialized Apple server clusters. Those clusters are built on the M series of chips so that they have built-in cryptographically secure data storage. It then processes that information, returns you the results, and I assume it deletes everything because it says it doesn't store any of this stuff. So your personal data can be used on the cloud to get results, but Apple never knows about it because it's all cryptographically secured. And they say that third parties can actually check on this to make sure that it's actually working the way that they say it is. So that's actually pretty reasonable security given the benefits that you have of communicating personal data into the cloud to get the benefit of these large server farms. That's actually pretty impressive what Apple is doing to protect your privacy. As they say, your data is never stored or made accessible to Apple. It's used exclusively to fulfill your request and then I assume it is deleted. So starting with Siri, you can speak to Siri more naturally thanks to to richer language understanding capabilities, you can maintain a conversational context. So if you ask it a question and then follow up on that question, it actually you know, has a through line. It understands that you just asked a question about a certain thing. And if you say, what about that or something, it's probably referring back to that previous part of the conversation. It has a memory of the conversation. It's able to reason on that and respond to you. So that's going to make Siri leaps and bounds more useful than it has been. Then of course, as I mentioned previously, there's type to Siri. So you, instead of talking to it, can actually type in your questions and get text-based responses instead of having to listen to it. So that will really, really help with uh, those awkward moments where you don't really want to talk to Siri in public. So if you have a question about changing a setting or doing something inside of the OS, it will actually understand how to do that and can potentially even act on that and do it for you. For example, if you got a message in your messages with somebody's address, you could say, could you please add this to his contact? And it would understand that it's Bob Smith or something like that. And it would understand that that's an address and it would put it directly into context without you having to do anything special. They also specifically call out on-screen awareness, which means it's going to be able to look at the screen. It's going to be able to see what you're looking at right then. So if you're looking at your calendar or something, it's going to understand that that's the context from which you're asking a question and it will be able to more reasonably answer that question for you. And then 
then we get the ability of Siri to be able to interact with multiple apps. Siri will have the ability to take hundreds of new actions in and across apps, including some that leverage our new writing and image generation capabilities. For example, you'll be able to say, show me my photos of Stacy in New York wearing her pink coat, and Siri will bring those up for you. You could also say, make this photo pop, and Siri will enhance it just like that, and Siri will be able to take actions across apps, so you could say, add this to my note with Stacy's bio, and it will jump from the Photos app to the Notes app and make it happen. So that is going to be very, very useful. And again, like I said, that is bad, bad days for the Rabbit R1 and the Humane Pin. Then they discuss the semantic index in some more detail. With its semantic index of things like photos, calendar events, and files, plus information that's stashed in passing messages and emails, like hotel bookings, PDFs of concert tickets, and links that your friends have shared, Siri will find and understand things it never could before. And with the powerful privacy protection of Apple intelligence, Siri will use this information to help you get things done without compromising your privacy. You'll be able to ask Siri to find something when you can't remember if it was in an email, a text, or shared note. So that's that is going to be really helpful. I spend a lot of time going back and looking for things and trying to remember in what context I had seen them before. It'll be much, much easier to just go like, hey Siri, like take care of this for me. There will also be writing assistance throughout the OS. For example, in an email, you could write an email, have it actually rewrite it for you in a more humorous or professional tone or something. You could have it do grammar checking. You can have it do all kinds of things. You could have it smart reply to emails, etc. So that is also going to be very, very nice with it being built in. Now, yes, there are apps that do that right now, but it's going to be super cool to have that built into basically every app that has writing involved in it. And one thing that I love is both on an outgoing email or if you get an email, you can get a summary of it, a TLDR. So if it's like a really, really long email, you can just get a quick summary at the top. And also apparently Apple Mail will put that at the top. Instead of the first couple lines that you can see, it will actually show you a summary at the top. So you can actually read that and determine whether you even want to open the email at this point or respond to it, etc. And here's something that I said said, oh, heck yes to. <laughs> a little stronger than that when I saw it. Apple Intelligence also enables an all-new focus called Reduce Interruptions. This is exactly what I've been asking for for so long. Right now, you either have Do Not Disturb, which turns off everything, which is too excessive, or you have Do Not Disturb off, in which case your phone is just buzzing constantly at you. This should be, if it works the way it's advertised, it should be a fantastic compromise between the two. So thank you, Apple, for listening. I can't wait to use that feature. That may be my new favorite feature. There's also Genmoji, which will allow you to create any emoji you want to, and an image playground that will let you create images, again, only in an illustrative style, never in a realistic style, which is a little unfortunate, but again, that's Apple's angle on all this. One thing that's important to note is I believe this all happens on device. So if you ask it to create these emojis and things like that, I think it does it all on the device. It doesn't send it to the cloud. I could be wrong about that. They were a little unspecific, but if it is able to do it on device, that's gonna be a very impressive feat. There's also gonna be a feature called Magic Wand in Apple Notes, which I use more and more every day, which will allow you to sketch something really quick and then kind of circle it and ask it to create a better version of it or something. And actually it says if you circle an empty area in the note, like just an area that's blank at this point, it'll look at the context of the note and generate an image based on the textual context. So that would be really, really cool to create images quickly that you can utilize to make sense of the text that you're looking at. Also AI will be there in the Photos app. You'll be able to automatically remove distracting background stuff in photos, and you can search for photos using natural language, like I want a picture of my son skateboarding when he was wearing that baseball cap that said Patagonia on it or something, right? And it'll go find those pictures instead of you having to go look through, you know, thousands and thousands of pictures to try to find it. So that will be very, very useful. Photos will also be able to put together nice memories and things like that. And you can even type in, I want a memory of our trip to Grand Teton National Park, and it will go and find the photos and figure out the best ones and even put appropriate music to it. So that actually sounds really, really cool as well. And then just like Fathom, it sounds like Apple's Notes app will be able to record things and it will be able to transcribe that and create an AI-based summary of it after the fact. So you'll be able to record a conversation, get a transcript and a summary of it. That will be really, really nice. Although it already exists on a bunch of apps on your phone and on the Mac OS. All right, and now let's get on to the spicy stuff, the integration of OpenAI's ChatGPT 4.0. Because there's no music in this section for a while, I'm gonna let Craig talk for a bit. Still, there are other artificial intelligence tools available that can be useful for tasks that draw on broad world knowledge or offer specialized domain expertise. We want you to be able to use these external models without having to jump between different tools. So we're integrating them right into your experiences. 
And we're starting out with the best of these, the pioneer and market leader ChatGPT from OpenAI, powered by GPT-40. First, we built support into Siri. So Siri can tap into ChatGPT's expertise when it might be helpful for you. For example, if you need menu ideas for an elaborate meal to make for friends using some freshly caught fish and ingredients from your garden, you can just ask Siri. Siri determines that ChatGPT might have good ideas for this, asks your permission to share your question, and presents the answer directly. So basically that's the crux of it. If the on-device AI, the Apple intelligence, determines that ChatGPT or eventually another LLM would be the best choice for answering a particular question, it will ask you. So that's actually really cool. It'll say, do you want me to make this request to ChatGPT? I assume it's just a yes, no kind of thing. You hit yes, it sends it off to the cloud. ChatGPT responds. Now, yes, that information that you requested and of course the answer is OpenAI's property but of course you'll know ahead of time that that data is going to OpenAI and you could choose maybe it's a private thing and you don't want it to go to OpenAI and you're like no I don't want to do that but if it's a request you know like a recipe or something like that ChatGPT can answer easily then sure you just send it out it sends back the response just the same as using it in a web browser but it's integrated into the OS and it just seamlessly does that if the Apple onboard intelligence determines that ChatGPT would be the best answer so I actually personally find this pretty cool. I didn't fully understand this until I listened to the keynote in more detail, but it sounds like this is a pretty decent way to handle the balance between getting the power of a large language model, a full large language model like ChatGPT with the privacy concerns that we all have, of course. Specifically, Craig says that your requests and information will not be logged and it's actually even safer than I was thinking originally. Specifically, Craig says you'll be able to access ChatGPT for free and without creating an account. So that's cool. So it'll just be like, you know, anonymous, I guess, sending it up there. And your requests and information will not be logged. And for ChatGPT subscribers, you'll be able to connect your account and access paid features right within our experiences. So of course, at that point, OpenAI will know it's you, but you'll also get a lot of advantages. If you're already used to using ChatGPT, I don't think that's gonna be a problem because you've already basically signed your life away at that point anyway. And this will be integrated across writing tools. It'll be integrated across Xcode and Swift programming and everything. So it's gonna be a really, really nice addition. And again, I think Apple's actually done this in a fairly delicate way that gives you the power of these large language models without reducing your privacy too much. All right, so that's the privacy portion of things. I'm going to sign off for the folks on Dr. No's AI. For the folks who are watching Dr. Know It All, let's stay tuned for Elon's reaction. All right, Dr. Know-it-all folks, let's take a look at Elon and the X community's reaction. And I have to admit, I was part of this reaction until I watched the keynote with a little bit more clarity. And I, I, I think that there may be a little bit of an overreaction, but we'll see what happens over the next 24 or 48 hours. Anyway, Far L says, a trillion dollar company is not able to ship their own capable AI. What's going on there? And Elon says, embarrassing. And I said, yeah, sad, really sad. But what I didn't realize was that ChatGPT4 is, is kind of a layer on top of everything else. Now, yes, of course, Apple should have developed their own large language model like XAI's Grok, like Meta's Llama, like OpenAI's ChatGPT, et cetera, et cetera. It is a little bit embarrassing that they haven't done this, but you know, they have a lot of other stuff under the hood. And because it's not just ChatGPT, but potentially a whole bunch of other large language models that will be available, sort of like a search engine, this actually makes some sense to me. Why reinvent the wheel? Why do this over again when they can just leverage these other tools? Then we start getting to the more spicy stuff here. Apple has basically embedded OpenAI, ChatGPT, into every single Apple device and Apple apps, and it scrapes all your personal information and data. It retrieves and analyzes your personal data across all your devices, source WWDC. And of course you see the double exclamation mark from Elon. Now, I don't believe that this is factually correct. I think that what they're talking about when they talk about scraping your personal information is the onboard intelligence built into the OS itself. It is not ChatGPT. ChatGPT is only the request that you specifically make and it asks your permission before it uploads to the cloud. So I think it's actually done in a pretty decent way. And Apple says, they claim at least, that they don't have access to your personal information. Even if it goes to their servers, it's still encrypted. They don't have access to it and it's deleted. So they never actually know what you asked or your personal information. So I think that they've actually handled it better than Mario is saying here. So of course, just a few other things. Elon says, here's the problem with quote, agreeing to share your data. Nobody actually reads the terms and conditions. I responded to that and said that any terms and conditions longer than a half page should be illegal. <laughs> if they did it, it was a half page, I would read it. It's just, I'm not gonna read 50 pages worth of terms and conditions, nobody does. And so yeah, you can get away with pretty much anything. Tommy about the Gen Moji stuff said, Steve is 
is turning in his effing grave. Yeah, you can see the little Gen Moji and stuff. I have to say, I doubt I'm gonna use the Gen Moji very much. And then finally, Elon's response here, if Apple integrates OpenAI at the OS level, then Apple devices will be banned at my companies. That is an unacceptable security violation. And he then says, and visitors will have to check their Apple devices at the door where they will be stored in a Faraday cage. So a Faraday cage is like a metal cage. It has, you know, it's a radiation blocker. So no radio signals can get in or out. Now, as we just saw from the keynote itself, OpenAI and ChatGPT are not integrated at all. They live in the cloud. The phone or the laptop makes the request to ChatGPT in the cloud. The answer then comes back and you have transparency and permission control over whether it sends that stuff. So it's not integrated at the OS level. I have to say that again, I thought that that was true myself before I paid more attention to it. I just listened to things relatively quickly and I was like, no, 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 that's crazy. But it turns out that Apple, I believe has actually done a pretty good job of securing things and locking it down. So while it does have information about you personally, that never leaves your devices and it's not something that's shared. It's not something Apple is exploiting. So again, I think a lot of people, including, like I said, me, are misinformed about all of this stuff. And as we discover more about it, I think we'll become more comfortable because I actually think that Apple has done this really in about the best way you can. I don't know how to do it much better than the way they've done. All right, so that's what I've got in this relatively long episode. Definitely let me know what you think in the comments. While you're down there, if you don't mind liking and subscribing, that would be amazing. And a big thanks once again to Aura Watch for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to click the link in the description and use Dr. 30 to get 30% off your new favorite watch. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.